Our culture has a tremendous prejudice against imagination. Think about it. It's never a compliment when someone tells you that you're only imagining things or that you're making things up, but the truth is that you can never make something up. The contents of the mind, the contents of the imagination, they have to originate somewhere. The unconscious is the creative source of all that originates into our experience, into our perception. If you can create a conscious flow of communication between the wider unconscious, which the mystics say is God, it's the mind of God. If you can create a connection of constant communication, like a telephone wire between yourself and God, why would you not do that? My name's Jordan, and it's my pleasure to welcome you back to Shadow Work Essentials, your well-meaning companion on your inward journey towards greater self-knowledge, deeper self-healing, and a wider sense of self-expression. If you're ready to begin exploring, understanding, and eventually, hopefully, resolving that swarm of internal conflicts and contradictions which underpin your everyday anxieties, depressions, fixations, and fantasies, then this is the video for you. Today, we're entering into dialogue with our unconscious. But if you're new here, then consider subscribing and hitting the bell button for notifications of bi-weekly uploads, and also following me over on Thornton Theory on Instagram, where I share a more intimate look into my life, my own personal shadow working processes, as well as daily stories and mystical poetry. Learning how to talk with your unconscious is an infinitely complex and ever-unfolding personal process, so we're naturally limited in terms of how far we can go in just one video. Nonetheless, I've done my best to split this episode into three tidy segments. In section one, we'll be outlining and exploring the imaginal state, dream states, and also I'll be giving you an overview of what you could expect from consistently following an active imagination process. I'll also be giving you further pointers towards reading that you can follow up on to supplement what we explore in this video. In section two, the three golden rules for active imagination. And in section three, the real meat of this episode, I'll be giving you a four-step repeatable process to have a rewarding dialogue with your unconscious every single time, or at least most of the time. Depends how well you follow the process. This is what you can expect from this episode. Let's dive in. Our culture has a tremendous prejudice against imagination. Think about it. It's never a compliment when someone tells you that you're only imagining things or that you're making things up, but the truth is that you can never make something up. The contents of the mind, the contents of the imagination, they have to originate somewhere. Psychologists and scholars have asserted for a long time that the human imagination is the, the function, the result of the individual and collective unconscious. Saints and mystics, on the other hand, across all the world's great religions, They've asserted something like the human imagination being a personal reflection of the infinite mind of God. See how the similarities are here. I find myself switching between both perspectives depending on the situation, but go with whichever language feels most comfortable to you. The crucial point is that the unconscious is the creative source of all that originates into our experience, into our perception. Our bodies, our emotional patterns, and some would even argue our thoughts themselves all stem from imagination. So what is imagination but the unconscious trying to communicate with us and communicating with us via symbols and stories and archetypes that are timeless and affect humans throughout the ages? And in that sense, the unconscious, the realm of imagination, the dream state itself is the core nexus of life. And that's why it's so important to get started with an active imagination practice. Inner work is a practical and ongoing experience that teaches us that if we can embrace the conflicts, if we can face up with bravery all of those tensions of dualities that we've been talking about throughout this series, with courage, with consistency, in the imaginal state, then we have the hope of reconciling. The, the image of the pine cone. I love pine cones. You surely know by this point. <laughs> The pine cone is the symbol to me of the growth that we can bring forward in life. 
There's so much potential on a single pine cone. This is a particularly big one, but it's still never going to be a tree. A pine tree drops hundreds of pine cones, and maybe not even one of them grows into the full potential. We're kind of like a pine cone in the sense that we know throughout all of the conflicts and all of the tensions, all of the smallness of just being a pine cone, we know we could be the pine tree. We have to know that there is a possibility for growth. We have to feel deeply within ourselves that there's a possibility for reconciling the tensions of the opposites. Carl Jung, who is a fan of dream work, nonetheless said that active imagination is a more effective place to reconcile these opposites. Because in dreams, you're, the, sim the symbols and stories, they happen to you. You're witnessing them but you're not consciously participating. Sure, you could lucid dream, but some Jungian scholars would say never attempt a lucid dream because it's often ego gratification. I mean, think about it. If you ever tried a lucid dream, if you're a guy, I'm sure you're going to be seeing a lot more women. If you're a, a woman, you're going to be seeing a lot more men, maybe in various states of undress, if you're straight, and if that's your ideal, of course. But you get what I'm saying, right? So lucid dreaming may not be the pathway. Active imagination seems to be the way to reconcile these opposites. When active imagination is done correctly, it pulls together the different parts. Yeah. When active imagination is done correctly, it pulls together these different parts of ourselves. It resolves, practically speaking, the this imaginary conflict between the fun-loving child and the responsibility-orientated adult that live inside of us, or perhaps the the fearless fighter and the persistent peacemaker. It collapses duality. Is why would we want to do this? What's the point of spending? hours of your life and going into really difficult places well i would say that if you can create a conscious flow of communication between the wider unconscious which the mystics say is god you know it's the mind of god if you can create a connection of you know constant communication like a telephone wire between yourself and god why would you not do that why would you not want to break down the barriers between ego and self, or between soul, spirit, God, all of these terms, all of these phrases, why would you not want to collapse all of that? Practically speaking, it reduces anxiety and depression, but more metaphysically speaking, you get in touch with the language of symbolism itself, you get in touch with timeless stories that express through us. They are us, but they're not us, and if we do it correctly, we can experience all of this, this whole realm that's normally not accessible to us, while still maintaining a distinct sense of being an individual human being. Sounds pretty good, right? Less depression, less anxiety. A greater sense of connection with God or with the unconscious. If you're secular, go for unconscious. If you're looking for spirit, as I'm sure you probably are, go with God. And finally, the sense of being a distinct human who has access to all of this, but still knows truly what I am in truth. That's the point of this. And that resolves on the imaginal plane, in the waking dream state, through active imagination. You want to get started? Let's get into the stages. A quick interjection for recommended reading. There is one book that I would suggest to anyone that is beginning with this work. This is the best book out there, I'm going to say it hands down, and it's, it's Robert Johnson's Inner Work. Using dreams and active imagination for personal growth. In addition to the reading list that's in the description of every video, this is where I would start. It is an absolute gold mine. Spend your money and invest in yourself. And quickly, if you're enjoying this video, please drop me a like. It matters a lot. This channel's really new and it helps the algorithm befriend me and treat me as a favorable human being. Necessary things, but you can really help me out with that. Anyway, three rules of active imagination. Let's go. Golden rule number one. This is a meeting of equals. You are not going into the unconscious with a hierarchical dominator mentality of the unconscious being some savage animal of undiluted pleasures and pains at a lower level of consciousness. No, that's not true. That's part of it. Sure, there's savagery, there's brutality, but there's also the greatest wisdom and the greatest potential. As we saw in previous episodes of Shadow Work Essentials, the golden shadow is all of the brilliance that we've yet to bring forward. Active imagination can be used for golden shadow work. Carl Jung, as a reminder, suggested that the shadow might be up to 90% golden, so the unconscious is not savage and barbaric. Not in the slightest. It contains that, and it's so much more. From this basic principle of meeting as an equal, you're in the place to go to principle number two. No script. 
Golden rule number two, there is no script. Unlike some kind of meditation or visualization exercise, you cannot go in and strong arm what you want from the unconscious. It doesn't work that way. Maybe it's best to imagine that you're literally meeting someone. This will be something that I'll show in part three, but imagine that you're having a conversation with someone who is respected. Maybe you don't understand so much. You're going to sit down and you don't have a script for that conversation. You can't have a script for that conversation. They have their own agenda. They have their own desires, wishes, needs, and they're locked inside of you or trapped inside of you and they're waiting to be heard. Inner child work works around this principle, fundamentally. Um, there's no script. Golden rule number three, building upon principle one, meeting of equals, building upon principle two, no script. Golden rule number three of active imagination, you are trying to listen more than you are trying to speak. Curiosity and receptivity is the king or queen of active imagination and working on the imaginal plane. You don't put words into the mouths of those that you meet. You don't decide in advance what's going to be said. You can't possibly have a goal for the conversation. You can maybe know that you're going to meet with the part of you that's a child or meet with the part of you that's a tyrant or the part of you that's um, a businessman or woman or a creative or a savage beast. You can know you're meeting with that part, but you can't decide what the goal of the conversation is. You can't decide the outcome because it's a relational process. It'll make more sense in stage three, but this should be enough for now. Golden three rules, final recap, meeting of equals, no script, listen more than you speak. These three rules, you'll get the most out of the four stage process. Let's go into it. Dr. Maria Louise von Franz and Robert Johnson, whose book I recommended earlier, have both shown through extensive clinical practice that active imagination falls into four natural processes. Empty the ego mind, invite the unconscious, dialogue and introduce values and ethics, and concretize with a ritual. For the sake of this video, I've simplified this into the four stages of invitation, inquiry, listening, and dialogue. Introduction of values and consensus reality ritual. I say consensus reality because we've been going in the dream states, but a, a ritual, you know, a ritual to make it real. Quick interjection. In this video, I'm talking about active imagination simply through voice dialoguing. It's through language, it's through inwards meditation, or through writing, or through speaking out loud. However, there are a variety of ways to speak with the unconscious that don't involve words. You could dance, you could paint. Carl Jung used to do mandalas. Um, there are many ways to do it, but I found that beginners or even people that tend to be more linguistic and more rational minded, which is the majority of us, let's face it, do benefit most from starting with this word based approach. But if you are naturally artistic, if you are a natural dancer, Maybe you want to go straight in for dancing. Robert Johnson has a story about in his practice. He used to have a woman that came in and her dream work sessions would involve him sitting behind his desk, progressively cowering more and more. She danced out these furious archetypes working through her. The possibility is there. But for the sake of this video, we're going to stick with words. Step one, the invitation. The first step of active imagination is to get yourself in a place where you are emptied of everyday concerns. It's a meditative state, it's a mindful state, similar to the other states that are required for different shadow working practices. You know what you need to do. Half an hour to 45 minutes undisturbed, no one's going to bother you, no external demands, and wait with the intention of inviting the unconscious. Don't be surprised if the unconscious archetypes that you want to talk to don't show up. If we spend so long, <laughs> if we spend so long trying to like slam doors and shut out the noise of that which speaks to us through dreams, why would it want to arise straight away? It's not so trusting. So give it time, allow it space, um, and it will show up. It may take a few meditations until a voice comes through, but you'll know when it's there because that's when we're in stage two. That's when you start to listen. Start. You start to. You hear a phrase. And you may intuitively know that this is the voice of the trickster, or this is the voice of the damaged inner child, this is the voice of the playful inner child. A myriad of voices could come through, but normally, at least in my experience, you'll hear a distinct voice, 
a phrase normally quite short, and at that point you can go into the conversation. If you're writing out your practice, you can open your eyes to the meditation and you can write in a style where it's all capitals for you and lowercase for the unconscious. You could speak into a voice recorder, maybe in a slightly higher voice and a slightly lower voice. It's very dramatic. You can do whatever you want. It's your private practice. Or you could simply sit with mouth shut and visualize and see what comes through and record it afterwards. It's really your preference. Going back to the three golden rules of active imagination, don't try and strong arm it. I can't give you a script. I can't tell you what will happen. That is the beauty of it. It's your unconscious mind or your, you know, your shred of the greater unconscious mind. Inquire, listen, and dialogue. But then we get to step three, and this is where we need the human will. Some scholars, some mystics have said that the human will is one of the most powerful forces in the in all of creation, in all of sentient life, because we have the power to introduce values and ethics on what otherwise would be randomness and barbarity. I mean, there's many ideas, platonic ideals about beauty and aesthetics, but for the sake of this video, let's just say that the human will is going to introduce a value. I'll give an example to make this real. So for example, we're, uh, we're meeting with the tyrant inside of us, and the tyrant has a variety of conversational points. Essentially, the tyrant wants more power, more control, more influence, and wants to go about it in a, a strong arm, harsh kind of way. You, as the ego ideal, can introduce the value of, yes, I understand that you want power and influence, however, we can't do it by stepping on other people. You can introduce the moral concern and reach a reconciliation point where the tyrant agrees, hmm, I can get what I want if I listen to this ego. So the tyrant gets satisfied, you give it a pat on the head, a, a scratch on the back, through your conscious will, through the exercising of your power of choice, and you reconcile. I'll give you a different example. Let's say it's an inner child experience of a part of you that feels very vulnerable and very wounded. Maybe there was a, a family member or an authority figure or maybe a former lover that said something wounding and you've been showing up with a symptom of like procrastination and anxiety and depression. You can't quite figure out what it's been. It's been around for months. You're not getting much done. You go into active imagination. You hear a small, quiet voice, and it's a whimpering inner child. And the inner child comes up to you in your visualization and wants a hug. You give the hug, and all that child wants is love and safety and security, and your everyday demands of responsibility, earning money, satisfying different relationships, showing up in the world in an adult way. That's far too scary, so you shut down, you get depressed, you get anxious. This is one possible pathway that many people suffer from. The introduction of values and ethics, stage three of the four-stage process, that might look something like having an hour of play every single day, withholding judgment and saying, you know what, I'm going to do an hour of painting, drawing, walking barefoot in the forest, I'm going to satisfy my inner child with the agreement to that seven, eight, nine-year-old part of us, or maybe even younger, that if I give you this, we're then going to go about our adult responsibilities for the day. 99% of the time you will reach a resolution point and you'll be able to move forward and you'll find that the anxiety and the depression that constricted your throat and your heart will melt away piece by piece. It may take a few attempts, a few conversations to build trust, but it will happen. So with these two examples, with the tyrant and the inner child, we get to stage four. Let's continue the examples forward. And that's the ritual. It's all very well and good working on the imaginal plane. It's all very well and good having journaled a bit or having spoken a bit, but it's not real. You need something to concretize it. From one of my own active imagination practices, again, I've used these archetypes of the tyrant and the inner child because I've done these active imaginations. I've met in the palace in my mind as the tyrant overlooks a crowd of fearful, fearful subjects and makes his bold demands and I see my own face on this tyrant and I, I needed to make a resolution so that I didn't become that kind of, well, I didn't allow that character to come through in full force. Same with the inner child, I didn't want to become a whimpering, pathetic man, but I still wanted to honor the vulnerable parts of me, so I need a ritual. I've already hinted at it, what might be the solution. For the inner child, a ritual would be a consistent practice, or it could be something like going out and buying that watercolor set that you wanted to paint with, or, I don't know, buying some Lego, buying some Play-Doh, buying some clay, whatever small ritual, concretize it, materialize it. And then with the tyrant, 
something maybe a bit more uh, difficult to bring a ritual forward, but you could do something truly symbolic, like having a ring that to you is a powerful king's ring, and you could wear it, and you could bring the king energy in. Or if you want to definitely suppress the violent parts of you that would be a tyrant, um, put it in the basement, not to lock it away, but it's no longer in control, you could take a large stick, that could be the tyrant stick, you could symbolically break it in half and bury it in the earth. You've broken the tyrant scepter. Tyrant doesn't have control, control over your actions, you have the conscious will. You see what I'm getting at? There's many specifics and many peculiarities that you can go through in these processes, this is merely a guide. I can't hit on every single point, but the, the core four-stage process of emptying the ego mind, inviting the unconscious, listening and inquiring, introducing the values and doing a bit of trading backwards and forwards and then making a ritual, this is a process you can repeat time and time again to get to the core of those anxieties, depressions and neuroses. It's really possible, and we can do it with this practice. Robert Johnson talks about it more in his book, that's why I recommended it for the third time in this video. I recommend it again. And there we have it. A dialogue with our unconscious, a dialogue on the imaginal plane. We have attempted and started to begin creating a relationship, a communication network with the unconscious within us, above us, around us, through us, with God, if you want to call it that. Um, crucial point, you're not rewiring your unconscious. You're not trying to dominate or be dominated, control or be controlled. You're creating an exchange of energy. You're creating an ongoing dialogue through inner work. You will get more out of this relationship, as with any relationship, the more the energy that you put into it. I could spend several hours giving various examples, but this is your journey. These are your choices. And if you apply these principles, the three golden rules and the four stage process and do some further reading outside, look at the reading list, you'll go far in this place. And I can guarantee that it brings a sense of happiness and stability and control that I didn't think was possible. It really is worth it. But in the meantime, go check out the next episode of Shadow Work Essentials. It's linked in the video, and like and subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you over there.